Sports Joe presents House of Rugby. Together with Heineken. Get the facts, be drink aware, visit drinkaware.ie. Hello and you're all very welcome to House of Rugby with thanks to Heineken. My name is Maud Rassen-Yrul and I'm delighted to be joined by Peter Stringer and Johnny Murphy to get stuck into the first weekend of the Rugby World Cup. Hi lads, how are we doing? Have we had a chance to digest everything from the weekend, Johnny? Yeah, it's been great. Um, started with a bang, I suppose, on Friday night and then uh, last night's game, uh, the Fiji-Wales game, was a cracker to finish it off. So uh, yeah, great to get started and I suppose we have to wait another couple of days to get back into the thick of it, but nice to get started. If we start by looking at Ireland's performance, I know there's not a lot we can read into a a game like that that's so one-sided, but a lot of cohesion, a lot of points on the board, no injuries, which is really important. What did you make of the whole performance against Romania? Yeah, look, I think first and foremost, you look at the scoreboard and that's, you know, really important. I think the number of tries they got, I think they showed great ambition to keep playing. Sometimes the case can be where you're so far in the lead against a side like that that you just kind of relax a little bit and your your job is done. But it just showed the professionalism of the team. Um, and like you said, the key point there is no injuries. Mm-hmm. Taking that through to the Tonga game, clean bill of health that Andy has to select from for the next game. A um, little bit slow at the start, I think, you know, given the warm-up games probably weren't at full tilt either. They weren't kind of hitting their straps properly. But I think that's just a mark of the tournament. And thankfully, the, the way the games are staggered, I think it's kind of marked for an increase in performance as the weeks go on, hopefully. Yeah, 12 tries, 82 points. Like, you can't not look at that and say, it was a good day. Uh, yeah, I think it would uh, a very, very good day, particularly kind of the last kind of two, three minutes where, you know, the clock is up, it's in the red, it's very easy for the lads to turn around, particularly under their own post and just kick the ball backwards and go out. And real interesting to hear kind of Andy at the end of the game, he was like, you know, mm-hmm. he was delighted to, that they went and they pushed for that. Um, so it just shows that ambition to play. Um, it was interesting enough. I think, you know, people are kind of in an interview. He, he spoke about the spread across, um, you know, what the, the spread was from a bookmaker perspective. And it was like he was acknowledging that they're aware of stuff like this and that they wanted to beat that. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is that kind of you can see that, you know, they're just being kind of honest in how they're looking at things and trying to put in kind of clear markers throughout every game. So, uh, but as the string said, I think that's the, the coming out without any injuries is is the most important thing and getting a nice bit of game time under people's uh, belts, particularly in the heat that they're going to experience over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, they kept going for 83 mm-hmm. minutes in that searing heat, like 35 degrees I don't even think I'd like to sunbathe in that heat. You're living in Dubai now, <laughs> so you're accustomed, you're acclimatised to this kind well, of Well, you'd be acclimatised going from the school run to your car very, very quickly, <laughs> like how, not playing a game. How difficult is it? Yeah, it's it's tough. I think yeah, I'd say that the, the hottest I played, maybe 33, 34 um, in France in a quarterfinal of a Heineken Cup one year. Um, but literally... I don't know how, you know, for 80, like you said, 83 minutes and to keep up that pace, that intensity, mm-hmm. to stay on it um, was a real mark. And I think right across the board for the weekend, it looked really, really hot right across France. So it's, um, look, it's great for the supporters. They're, they're enjoying themselves. Yeah, getting and a lovely getting, tan. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, look, it'll be tough. It's something they're going to have to manage, obviously, with training sessions during the week, you know, making sure the guys are in out of it and they're not yeah. too kind of dehydrated or whatever, but look, they have the right team on board to, to manage that as well. So Especially when you think of what's coming down the line like the physicality of South Africa in that heat mm-hmm. it's going to be really difficult to deal with uh, yeah it is but I think they're set up to do that um, I think they're kind of sending out a message as well by wanting to play you know 83 84 minutes particularly with their ball and play sets you look at the game on um, you know you look at the game on Friday evening and um, you know France were kind of gassed a bit coming up to half time mm-hmm. so they're they're clearly working on their conditioning to be able to someone like, you know, I had marked it down after the game, someone like Tyg Byrne, who was who got through an astronomical amount of work mm. for him to run 50 to 60 yards yeah. in the last play of the game to score that try. That's huge. Like it just shows the conditioning that they've put under their belts over the last six to eight weeks as a group. It, so a real injection of pace. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's just like so yeah. impressive. Yeah. It's just like your, de- your legs will be hanging at that yeah. stage for yeah. the work that he'd got through. Was and like phenomenal. he's wearing a scrum cap for like 80 minutes as well. <laughs> That's going to add another 10 degrees onto him as well. Uh, but physically your hands I'd imagine would be quite sweaty which would lead to slippery 
ball and probably led to a lot of the handling errors that we saw. Would you be worried about that? Would you put it down to rustiness and the conditions? Yeah, I think when you look at it and how the schedule pans out, this was probably like their third or fourth preseason game and it enables them to kind of move on that way. So um, a couple of bits of their link play, yes, when they got their hands free, those offloads didn't go to go to hand, but that's going to get better. And as you know, as we've already said, when they climatize that heat training in a day in, day out, that's going to give them, um, you know, I think they're they're well set up to, to, to really kick on from here. Yeah, they have that match fitness, which they showed playing on for 83 minutes, as Johnny said. But... I heard Brian O'Driscoll talk after the game and it's um, he put it down to game plan fitness as well, that they are able to keep their structure, to keep their shape. They know their roles and that's even more important. It is. Because, yeah, like obviously when I, when I played at nine, you know, right throughout my career and you look to increase the tempo and I think this the squad that, that Andy has now and the way he wants to play, it's just that high tempo. And if, if there's a picture in front of them, they've got that license to go and play. There's no real set structure off quick ball. Um, and the, the trouble sometimes you may have with maybe your forwards, maybe not being as fit as you would have liked them. But I think when you look at this team, like you said, two second, three second ruck ball that the guys are in that position that when as a nine, when you pick that ball up, Sometimes in the past, guys might have been flat to the line. Some set of forwards might only be getting off the ground to get back into position. And even though the ball is available there at the back of the rock, it may not be in a position. You might just have to slow it down. But everyone now realizes that the game, the tempo that they want to play, they got to be in that position because mm -hmm. if that nine, he's got that license to play the ball away. And if they are not in that position at the correct depth and the correct alignment, then they're at fault and you're certainly going to be picked out on a Monday morning in that review. So I think that's great. I think there's no slowing the game down for anyone to get into position. Mm -hmm. Guys just play off that front foot. And when it's that fast ball, they've got that license to go and do what they want. Looking at Ireland's fixture list and when we're talking about acclimatising to the weathers and kind of getting rid of the rustiness, do you think it, it suits them better as opposed to New Zealand, France on Friday straight in? Uh, yeah, I think it does uh, because they can layer on each game. Uh, they can get the right amount of game time into all their, their key players. You know, someone like Johnny who's coming back, you know, he got a good kind of 60, 65 minutes underneath his belt this weekend. He can go on again and you're not then worried about where he is when it gets down to kind of the, the two pivotal um, group games. Um, same for the front row. But then also it's being able to manage, you know, particularly their, you know, the you know, from four to eight in terms of the quality that, that they have there. You know, they still have Jack Conan to come back in. Josh Hunter Flyer is on the bench. Mm -hmm. um, Ian Henderson, you know, he's someone that physicality, his physicality is going to be massively important when, when we do play South Africa. So it's managing that game time um, for all those guys. Uh, I think it, it, it gives it gives the, the the management the opportunity to do that and give everyone um, the minutes that they need yeah. to then make a clear out, right, this is our starting 15, this is our starting, this is what our bench is going to look like. But it gives them the opportunity to plan for, for that. Andy Farrell, I'm sure, will have picked out some work-ons as well from that performance. It wasn't perfect, but he will like to have those things that he, he can focus on during the week now as they lead up to Tonga. Was there anything in that performance that would have worried you a bit? Maybe Peter Romani pointed out the line out. We saw it creaked a bit against Samoa as well. Is there anything that you'd you'd be wary about? Just the first couple of minutes and <laughs> leaking that try. Um, no, look, I think it's it's always difficult against a side like Romania. Um, look, they're 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 professional. Um, they're in the World Cup. They're going to hit hard. They're going to be physical. And I think that the guys may or may not have been surprised at how long Romania just kept hitting bodies, kept hitting bodies. And I think Tonga are going to be the same. Um, so I think it's about we we spoke about already just having that depth of the plays out the back, running the right lines, all those little plays, which will, will come about over time. You know, when you're a little bit rusty in your preseason, you know, getting those timings right, getting those little pop passes or the pullbacks. Um, I think we saw that in the Samoan game, though, when these guys just come up out of the line. You're going to face against South Africa as well. You're going to have like Peter Steph to toy flying out of the line, mm -hmm. putting guys under pressure. So it's how you how you read defenses. Um, and I think that's a that's a big thing with this team that they're going to face different defenses as they go through the competition. So it's about playing to the line, but also being a little bit deep enough that you 
don't actually have to take to the line. The defence are going to come to you. So all those little reads um, and it's going to be a little bit different with every team. So um, line out, like you said, was was it's a big part of it. Set piece, you know, they got some great launch plays off line out. We know that, how good they are and how inventive they are and creative and coming up with new ideas. And they're going to have to do that against the better teams as mm-hmm. they go on. So the set piece has got to be on the money every time. Yeah, they're not going to have the same time on the ball against Tonga, against South Africa, against Scotland. So this performance, it has to have an asterisk beside it. It was against Romania, it was such a weaker side. What will they take mostly out of this game? Is it all about momentum and just getting that first win under their belt? Yeah, I think, and also minutes. Um, you know, you, there's only so much training you can do. You need to put yourself in a in a pressured situation. Um, you know, there's a big crowd there at the weekend. Um, the, the temperature we've already said and, you know, being put under pressure. OK, they are a weaker side, they're a tier two side, but, you know, it's you're still under kind of match intensity at that. Um, and that's that's the biggest thing um, that you can then work on your pairings, work on your connections. What they do really well is they hold their width. OK, they might have kind of 12 to 13 guys around the ball, but they always have one to two people in that wider channel. And when they face, as String said, when they face this different these different types of um, of attack of defense, their attack just allows them to be able to, particularly with that person in the wider channel, be able to go to space very easily and very quickly. Um, so I think just putting that under a game intensity is is really, really important. And it just, we've already said it, it just allows them layer every week on week, week on week. They've returned to tours, their training camp now, and they have no injury concerns that we know of. They won't be taking Tonga for granted. Mm. It'll be Tonga's first match. Uh, I heard their uh, head coach, what's his name, Kifu, talk about Tonga. And he was mentioning how this is the best Tonga team to ever take to the World Cup. So what can we expect from them? Look, physicality, there's there's no there's no shying away from that and what they're going to bring. Um but I suppose, you know, they've got that little bit of cohesion, I think, as well. Like like the other island teams, you look at Fiji, you look at Samoa, and they're 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 able to control games a lot better uh, than they would have in the past, you know, rather than one off players and having that kind of structure, you know. But I think they have this time around, you know, with Pietau as well. I think they've got some real quality mm-hmm. there. They've got they're, a lot of ex all backs mm, and ex wallabies. The guys who are coming back, mm-hmm. you know, from who have played at international level with other countries. I think that's the the biggest plus for them. Um, so look, there's no doubt about it. And he's going to shuffle, reshuffle his team. He's going to get guys in there, prepare for a physical battle because I think, you know, it's about, you know, like Johnny said, managing players through this competition. It's all well and good going on a tour. You know, you beat New Zealand in a game, you might beat Tonga in a game or Australia in these one-off matches, which Ireland have done, you know, really well in the past. Mm-hmm. But a World Cup, you piece it together week after week after week playing against these top sides. And it's how you recover, how you keep guys in good condition. So I think we've got a squad. We've got a really good squad of, you know, 30 odd guys. Whereas in the past, we might necessarily, we would have had to play, you know, a lot more of your first 15 in these Mm -hmm. types of games, which I think Andy, he's got that luxury of being able to call upon other guys who are chomping at the bit, who genuinely feel that they've got a chance of starting in that test team come the knockout stages. I think that's sort of a massive driver within this team, that there's no real set starting 15, that everybody feels that they're on a par with their peers. So how will he approach the Tonga fixture now? What changes should he make? Uh, I think you're probably going to try and he's do some kind of horses for courses stuff. You'd imagine that um, van der Fleer will come in, you know, try and get some, uh, you know, having that out and out seven there, uh, probably Henderson to come into the, the the second row, add a bit of bulk in terms of uh, probably more experience in, in and around that physical side, physical pa- capacity of the game. And then it's to see if Jack Conan, there's word that he's good to go, maybe whether he's going to be on the bench or give him, you, he is someone that you would hopefully imagine would would at least be on the bench against South Africa just with the physicality that it, th- that he brings um and then in the back line you imagine um you know probably after the way Bundy played this weekend he might he they might might rotate that because they've got three legitimate starters and they have to find out where who fits into those into those slots um 
And then you probably look at maybe someone like Jimmy O'Brien coming back in. He's someone that might be in that 23 spot all the time because of his versatility. Um, and then it's the conversation that I suppose Andy and Johnny are going to have around mm -hmm. where where he's going to fit in. But if he starts, he's probably going to be starting then. You know, he'll be starting early mm -hmm. every game. So it's just yeah. to try and manage manage him and manage his minutes. You, you know, he, he, he wants, he wants, he wants to, play. to play, but yeah. it's, it's a then... What, what happens if he's injured and mm -hmm. you need time, obviously, for, yeah. you know, either, you know, Ross or, or Jack. Um, so that's that's the dilemma, giving them enough game time that there's a balance there, but also keeping your your motivated leader on the field to, to direct everybody else around you. That's the challenge. Who do you feel needs to get extra minutes under their belts, the, apart from the players that Johnny mentioned there? Is there anyone else? Um, I think... You know, looking at the team that played the last day, you know, that's not far off. I think you're, you know, potentially you're starting test mm -hmm. side. Um, you know, obviously, Robbie, you know, it is is slight little bit of a niggle uh, in, in that centre position. And look, they're, they're, he's fighting for position as well. And, you know, Dan Sheen, whether he's ready to go or not, is another, he's a case for putting his hand up. He's he's a guy I think Ireland need in those kind of knockout stages going forward. Um, so, like, they're, they're, they're guys... Um, that you'd, you'd look at. Um, I think everybody else, like, like Johnny is slotted in. He hasn't played in, in how long? Played 65 minutes. Looked like he'd just never taken a week off. Mm -hmm. And that's just the mentality. I think that's the way it is with a lot of these guys, that they're so well conditioned. And it's not a case where, you know, they've gone and done nothing from their previous game to the next one, that the intensity of their training, that they they're can just hit the ground They running. can hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. that, that you're playing against, you've got 30 guys there. Of like unbelievable standard and quality, so that's as good as test matches. Whenever they have those training games, anyway, and you're com coming up against each other, so I think in terms of they've you know they showed in the past that they are professional enough that when they get an opportunity to play, that no one needs really any time to kind of bed their way into anything. Well, speaking of Johnny Sexton, this weekend saw him return to the Ireland team for the first time in almost six months due to injury and suspension. And he spoke to the media in the aftermath of Ireland's win and feels there are still improvements to be made to his game. Yeah, six months uh, thinking about it. Obviously, part of that was, was self-inflicted with my mistake. Um, but like once the, once the plan was clear to me and, and Andy said, look, you just got to target that first game. We were, we were able to to train hard, do a bit of prep work for for this game in particular. But um, yeah, hopefully I'm better for it. Hopefully I can improve my performance for for Tonga. Um, and like I said, it's going to be a much more uh, difficult game. Um, they're obviously a different caliber of player. And no disrespect to Romania, I thought they fronted up, you know, brilliantly, um, and they're very physical. Um, but you know, we see. This, the team that Tonga have and we know the, the threat they'll have had this weekend off and they'll be just prepped for, for our game. They'll have two or three weeks just focused on our game. I think they've they've said that publicly. So it's going to be a huge challenge for us um, and we've got to be ready. World Cup is week on week. Um, you know, we got to be we got to be ready every week. Well, he was one of four Irish players to score two tries at the weekend. We kind of touched on his performance, but we'll go into it in more depth now. He looked mentally fit he looked physically fit and he spoke about improvements to his game there Johnny but he looked pretty good yeah he did he looks in serious condition um, I suppose as he said once the plan was clear you know it was just about sticking to that and getting there in, in um, you know in one piece um, I think the phys the physical side of the game will stand to him now being able to take those hits um, and he got through you know there was I think there was one, everyone, I suppose, in Ireland when he scored his first, uh, second try, and so when there was oh, his the, wrist, yeah, when they dove <laughs> on his wrist and he got up, everyone was what like, "What have you done?" <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of sharp and take a breath across the whole 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 of Ireland, but uh, yeah, like he, he, you know, he got through in flying colours, and you judge there by what he just said. And we spoke about it earlier. He's mad keen to play. Like yeah. he's already talking about fronting up week in, week out. So, um, yeah. So it looks like we're going to see him hopefully again, <laughs> as he says, week on week. <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt in his mind, Peter. He <coughs> is raring to go. He wants to play against Tonga, but should we not just wrap him in cotton wool? Yeah, I, th I think so. And given what we've seen in the past, that he has the ability to take a week off and still perform at his best. He doesn't need to be playing every single week. And I understand the mentality of a professional sports mm -hmm. person. You just want to play every week, particularly knowing it's your last, it's your last run. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think from that point of view, um, I think they got to manage him. And 
probably selfishly looking at it from, like we said already, in terms of the backup and seeing who fits into the team well, who is able to manage those situations. Because, you know, if Johnny does pick up an injury, then who is in control, who is able to kind of call the plays, who is able to be that coach on the field when it really matters. Um, and that backup person, I suppose, even six months ago, we were thinking, who who is it going to be? And, and you know, it's kind of still thinking um, what, what that kind of, that is going to look like going forward. So it's um it's 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 a, it's a big thing, but I think Johnny just has to listen to Danley <laughs> and say, "Look, there's a bigger picture at stake here." I wouldn't like to be in Andy's shoes. Yeah. <laughs> um, looking at who came on for him, Jack Crowley uh, came on, got 20 minutes under his belt. Is he Johnny's backup? Has he pushed ahead of Burn? Do you think? Um, possibly, possibly so. Uh, you know, I think how he finished the season out with Munster probably put him on par certainly with Ross and then you you know I think that you know I thought at the time that Munster winning um, you know Munster winning the league and then Leinster not winning the European Cup probably could have been the best thing for all because the Munster guys were bouncing into camp like you, you know, would with say huge that confidence. anyway yeah. <laughs> with huge <laughs> Two confidence Munster players yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with huge confidence and then you know the Leinster guys might you know have that kind of bit of a chip on their shoulder but I do think that that confidence that he gained over kind of the end of the you know the last two months of the season was massive for Jack um, and you know he's been in the melting pot you know particularly down in down in South Africa um you know managed the team really well playing six seven games on uh, in a row away from home yeah. um i think it's very very tight but at the moment for me he probably just shades it shades it a bit um but so would you start a, jack against um, tonga uh, I wouldn't. I'd uh, start Johnny and have Jack on the bench. Would um, you start Johnny? Yeah, I'd take a gamble um, and have Johnny three in a row, and then play Jack or Ross against Scotland um, and see what see what happened then. That's where that's the way I'd do it. I'd take a take a gamble on that. I just think that if you look at it. When we get to a quarter final, so if Johnny doesn't, if he doesn't play this weekend, he has to go, you know, five games in a row. Where if he can play two, two and a half, you know, three games, week off, then he's set back up for, you know, quarter final, semi final, final. Where it's just that management. I think that if he can have a break middle, it is a big risk, but. I just think it, it gives him a gives him a good chance. I don't know. Uh, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> um, Would you not I, just put him on the bench and give him thirty minutes? Yeah. I don't think he's a bench player. Yeah, I, I I would have him on the bench though. I would. You don't want to think back to Japan twenty nineteen and not have no, him in the team I at just, all. I think I think the week off between South Africa and Scotland allows them to, you know, and, and I'm talking about that kind of run of mm. games that he potentially will have. I think, um, yeah, I I just I I'd, I'd be more comfortable getting that backup player more game time in, in, in the game against Tonga um, and if it's Jack or if it's Ross and I probably think it's Jack gets a start and with Johnny on the bench I might be wrong though he's the coach yeah, well, <laughs> I, I just think we beat Scotland uh, I think w w we'll beat Scotland without Johnny I think we have good enough quality and I think that the lads are used to playing you know they played obviously mm -hmm. South African sides but I just think um, you know and, and like probably six to nine months ago we were wondering where are we going to get this mm -hmm. replacement yeah. from what, what's going to happen so we're still in a luxury we're in a we're in a really good spot with, with what we have behind okay they're not they, they're not Johnny like Johnny is world class but I just I, I think from my perspective it's worth the risk I know I'm going to be shot down <laughs> but whatever I'll, I'll throw it out there it's mm. crazy to think though he's Ireland's oldest player he overtook John Hayes John Hayes was 37 he's 38 now and he's still Ireland's most important player it's hard to imagine anyone being older than John Hayes John <laughs> Hayes just like seems to be the oldest man in the world I thought, I thought that was you only you, you just kept lying yeah yeah I, I kept lying <laughs> um, yeah look he's at an age it's just it's his it's his energy you can even hear him talking there mm. about yeah his one or two errors, you know, and he'd be kicking himself for that grubber. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's just the little things that still matter so much to him. And like, that's just it's it's unbelievable to see. And I think when someone gets to that stage of their career, you know, you so expect some bit of kind of, you know, taking the foot off the pedal. But just with Johnny, I think when he knows that the end is in sight 
and they're on such a, a world stage and there's such an opportunity there for this team that he's kind of really ramped it up and I suppose he was he was written off you know five six years yeah. ago and he's just come back and he's got better and better um, and I've no doubt it's down to him and obviously the coaching staff as well that this team has progressed in the last three or four seasons to the level that they have. Well, looking at our opposition, if we're looking towards the quarterfinals, if we look back at the other results over the weekends, Friday night, France, they got the better of New Zealand. Are you in no doubt now, Johnny, of who you want to meet in the quarterfinals? Uh, I looked at the game on Friday night thinking, I'm kind of happy playing either, to be honest. Um, I just felt that, you know, I was surprised about how kind of gassed, um, you know, France were coming up to the last kind of two, three minutes in the first half. Um, a couple, I know they're a huge side, but they were, you know, a couple of lads took, you know, 10, 15 seconds to get up off their knee and break, break and play. Um, you know, it was mentioned in commentary. I, I wouldn't, I, I also think that, you know, New Zealand, are not in a place that we thought they'd be in. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether that's because, you know, Joe's influence of how structured he can be, whether that is kind of going against them as a as a, as a as, as a core in terms of what their beliefs are. They're just off for some reason. Yeah. I don't know whether that's going to be fixed throughout the you know throughout the competition. But I was sitting there watching it going. Be happy to take either of these on. Um, I like your confidence. It was a nervy yeah. performance by yeah. both sides. It was, yeah, and I think. The way France came through and they show that kind of resilience just shows me that, look, there's 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 there is more to come from them. Um, but from a New Zealand perspective, you talk about Joe Schmidt there and I think you talk about structure and the way he plays. Yeah, but they kicked the ball away aimlessly. There wasn't even a, a plan to kick mm -hmm. to retain possession. You know, Bowden Barrett was just aimlessly kicking ball away, gifting that French back three ball, giving them an opportunity, played them back into the game the way New Zealand played, just kicked it away. Um, and again, in terms of a structure, I just thought New Zealand looked completely rudderless, um, yeah. no real focus. Um, and, and an amazing start to the game. Yeah. But they weren't able yeah, to yeah, capitalize yeah. on it. Yeah. And, and, I, and I saw them in, you know, in that the rugby championship before that South African game. And I thought, geez, these guys are, they're, they're building to becoming yeah. something really great again. But again, just that French side. Um, France have the ability to create something out of nothing. And that's yeah. always the fear with these guys. When when it clicks for them, and it, obviously there was there was nerves around that French team, I think, obviously playing at home, there's so much pressure on them. Um, but I think that will give them a huge amount of confidence. And I'm afraid to say that I feel that they will build a lot more in the coming weeks. What impressed you about their performance? Um, I think like that they 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 were so close to a couple of unbelievable tries like Penno there was a crossfield mm -hmm. kick and he literally like a fingertip away from Sam yeah. like there was a couple of opportunities where they could have scored like two of the best tries ever scored in world in World Cups like their ability to to counter attack and score off nothing um their individual threats across everywhere. You know, um, and I just think, you know, Aldrich is just he's playing mm -hmm. phenomenally yeah. well. Um, so they have, you know, Sean Edwards obviously has completely changed not only their defense, but also their mindset um, in terms of how they go about it. Um, but it's just their threats from one to 15. You look at what they have coming off the bench. Um, they are very much an all round an all round side um, but I think you know going back to New Zealand I think talking about their kicking I think teams are now looking at France in terms of what we did to them in Dublin and there's a huge amount to talk about the amount of ball and play time in that game it was the highest ball and play time yeah. ever in, in international rugby it was kind of like okay they're just kicking the ball back so they keep it in play they keep it in play keep it in play but there was no structure as mm -hmm. as string said to actually attack off that when it was on when they were tired or when their front row had done you know maybe five or six kind of you know shuttle runs they didn't they just kept kicking yeah, it yeah. you know so that was kind of they they just looked lost in, in that regard but just interesting wondering is a bit of a trend or people think like this is how we beat france have massive ball and play time try and gas them a bit and then go after them at the right time um that might be one of their weaknesses. They did show frailties in defence as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think li- how Ireland are set up to play with their multiple threats across the line, as I, as I said earlier on, having someone in the in the fifteen all the time. There's yeah. never anyone. There's uh, n- there's never anyone not there. Not there. That allows us to kick the ball there if it's on, and if they tighten up and they can de- and they condense, our kicking game is enough. That that causes problems for teams because we have options the whole way across the pitch all the time. I think New Zealand found that space. You know whether it's on the edge or if it's over that kind of that that initial rush mm. from 10, 12, 13, they found that space. So you know whether it's you know um, that kind of hard press with Penno on the outside coming up and. Him being a little bit narrow, and look, Ireland will. There's no better analysis team, and I promise you, in terms of the conversations yeah. that are going around with the coaches in that room, coming up with specific plays in how to target, you know, France if we have to come up against them at some point. Um, it's you know that the, they will have plays to come up against it. And you look at the try that New Zealand scored over the top of Penno on the left hand side, where everyone thought that it was a forward pass. Um, that's exactly what Ireland can do. They can throw that long ball into the 15 because they have someone there all the time. Um, and that's kind of a blueprint of how you can uh, how you can expose that space on the edge when their wingers are high, go you know go over the top and they lose sight of the ball. I think that is something that, you know, when you analyse them, as Shrink said, that's, that's where the space is and that's where those opportunities are. They have an easy run in now, New Zealand and France. They have Namibia, Italy and Uruguay in their group. They're only going to improve. The pressure is off them a little bit until they reach the quarterfinals. It is. Um, I suppose you want to be battled hardened enough when you get to a quarterfinal yeah. stage. Um, but look at the, the way it's going now. You know, f- France top that pool. Um, New Zealand come second. So it gives them the luxury to to rotate their squads uh, if they wish. Um, and it certainly is, you know, it's it's a, it's an easier group th- than what we have. So it's going to be interesting in terms of, you know, the condition of those guys you know, when it comes to a quarter final as as we will be um, and how, I suppose, conditioned, how injured or what the bill of health is going to yeah. be like. Well, we look at other results. We had Italy beat Namibia 58-3. Eddie Jones's winless run came to an end. Australia beat Georgia 35-15. England got their campaign up and running. George Ford, of course, the hero, kicking 27 points there as they beat Argentina 27-10. Japan, Chile finished 32-12. The reigning champions got off to a winning start against the Scots 18-3. And an exciting game to finish last night. Wales beating Fiji 32-26. So, Johnny, what was your pick of the weekend? Um... Last night's game was brilliant. Uh, mm. The Fiji uh, Wales game, I thought, was phenomenal. Uh, they were very unlucky towards the end. Uh, a couple of decisions could have gone their way, particularly kind of in the last kind of eight minutes, where they put Wales under uh, huge pressure in terms of yellow yeah. cards. Yeah. Um, and then even despite that, not getting those calls, the last play of the game, if you freeze frame it, you know they had a four v two on the edge, and they throw a long ball over the top, and it bounces up, and Andrade doesn't doesn't take it up. Where if they'd actually play played the second man in, he probably goes underneath the post, and they win the game. Um, but like Fiji are a proper side, and I think they were really really unlucky. Um, another one that stands out for me is England's performance. Um, you know they were kind of down and out, but particularly the transformation in their line speed their line speed compared to where they were over the, you know, three warm up games, it was night and day. You know, yeah. they were so they were so hard, so aggressive. And I was really disappointed with with, with Argentina. They kind of just fell to the Because a wayside. lot of people had Argentina yeah, picked to beat them. Yeah, I was I, I would have fancied Argentina to to kind of go to to go and win that game. Um, but they just couldn't handle their line speed. And it was literally they got caught in completely in the headlights. It was they just couldn't handle how aggressive they were. You look at kind of the first even seven to eight defenders in the uh, England defence, they're sprinting off the line mm. and they're really mm. putting under pressure. So obviously Kevin Sinfield, I think there's obviously what he's done off the pitch. Yeah. Uh, teams um, papers are very slow to kind of go after kind of what what you know what he's doing on the pitch. And seemingly the Telegraph wrote a pa- uh, wrote a piece about him kind of about seven days ago, and it was a clear kind of well, this is actually what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Um, I was you know they were okay in attack, but I thought that for a team that was written off yeah. uh, defensively, they really really barred up. 
Did they show you enough to make you believe that they're contenders or are they still very one dimensional? Uh, I, w- I, would, I wouldn't say contenders right now. Yeah. No, I think they've certainly shown something that we haven't seen in the last six to eight months from them. Um, Argentina did everything they could to give them the ball back. They <laughs> kicked them, they, they dropped the ball, they gave them plenty of possession to work with. Um, yeah, bitterly disappointed with the way Argentina played. But we've seen that from defences. S- Johnny mentioned the way you know, England's line speed and how that can throw a team. You look at the South African versus Scotland game and South Africa just got in their faces, completely flustered Scotland. Yeah. Scotland had no attacking uh, flair. They dropped the ball. They looked like they were, they were watching the men at the end and, and not, not looking at the ball. They were dropping balls. So it's, it's funny where you can analyse a team before you go into a game and if you see a team predominantly comes up and drifts across and, and is a really soft defence and you can plan your whole game plan, your whole attack based on that. But as soon as they throw some spanner in the works, getting off the line really, really quickly, like Peter Steph de Toy for South Africa was had nearly had that sole job yeah. of coming out of the line and nearly targeting that second receiver. So whenever Finn Russell got the ball and whatever player he was passing the ball to, that Peter Steph de Toy had that man targeted or the guy out the back. So it put everybody else under pressure. So, you know, you may not have, you know, based your whole game plan. And suddenly you need a plan B because it's a completely different mindset to attack against a defensive side like that. So um, it's interesting how teams can can do that. So I think looking ahead, I think Ireland are going to be faced with a few different defences. What will they have learned from the Scotland um, South African game? They'll have learned. Look, I think that both sides are very beatable. Um, I think, you know, Scotland looked a shadow of themselves uh, previously. Um, South Africa always posed the threat of that physical game. Um, Again, those crossfield kicks, they got to be wary of. But I think there's nothing there that shows you that Ireland can't beat these teams in kind of in a, in a one-off game. So, again, they manage that defence, manage that really, really hard press from South Africa. You know, holding your width. You know, those crossfield kicks, putting balls in behind. You know, whether it's a more of a territory-based game rather than having to play the ball. You know, when there's these guys rushing in your face. So I think um, they'll do their homework. They will look at the game again. But there's definitely opportunities there officiating it was a weekend where the referees came under the spotlight again and I suppose they're there on the biggest stage it's not an easy job to do but all teams are asking for and all fans are asking for is consistency and we didn't get that so how do teams approach the next couple of weeks? I don't know it's going to be hard I think that um one of the big things is that they have to take control of their own destiny, uh, their own destiny to to a certain extent. You know, people are going on about Curry's red card. In reality, he can stop. He can control that situation much better. Um, he loses control of his feet. He doesn't kind of um, you know chop his feet close to the contact and then drop and then hinge at, at his hips. I think the biggest thing, if you can hinge at your hips, which means you have to be in control of your own body weight and your own speed there's not going to be any problems. There are going to be certain rugby incidents that just look like, say, the Randrandra and, and um, Dan Bigger one last night. He just gets caught in his heels and it's not a pleasant experience for him, but technically it's yeah, high. Yeah, so yeah. do you penalise him even though he gets run over? <clears throat> it's that That's the difficult one for, for referees. But I do think that players need to take responsibility and, you know, they have to work on controlling their feet. They have to work on hinging at the hips. If you do that, you know, again, last night, you look at the left winger. He had an unbelievable tackle where he's actually like kind of Superman in the air, mm-hmm. but perfectly legal. And it's as physical a tackle as you've seen all weekend. And it's what we want to see. We want to see that, but it's perfectly legal. Um, so I just think that the players need to help themselves um, a bit more and particularly in those aerial battles if you're trying to um, you know time your um, time your hit when someone lands be a small bit later you'll actually get you'll be a more effective tackle because your weight will be on your toes and you'll be able to get forward and you'll hit someone probably in the solar plexus potentially dislodge the ball but I just think that players need to take control of their own destin- destiny a bit more and start sinking and, and controlling their feet last minute yeah, 100% agree. Um, again, it's it's probably a lot of the controversy around the referees and how each referee is kind of deemed the, ta- the very similar tackles to yeah. be 
penalized in different ways. It's so just frustrating. It is from frustrating. From the player's perspective, from the manager's perspective and from the fans. Like Jesse Creel had a tackle in the South Africa yeah. game quite early and it, for me it, it seemed Didn't even go to pr- TMO. pretty similar to mm. Tom Curry's collision and that there was no attempt by the tackler to, to bend or hinge at the hips. Um, so it's just that and people are kind of wondering and, and that's what gets co- coaches frustrated, players mm. frustrated. Um, but 100% take Johnny's point. Look, if, if players can't argue the laws are there from World Rugby. If you're in that upright position, you are leaving yourself wide open to be yellow card, bunker or red card if you do not look mm-hmm. to bend at the hips. And you've got no you've got no qualms about it, but it it's just that consistency from referee to referee that the coaches will will demand. Fiji will feel hard done by as well with some decisions. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um and like we mentioned with the yellow card, so you know, they Wales definitely deserved to receive a few more yellow cards in those positions in the field. And as soon as Fiji were penalised once, they were yellow carded. So those kind of moments where um, referees have just got to got to take control of it and and be very very balanced in their approach to both teams and yeah. you know giving cards when they're deserved. Before we finish up, who impressed you the most over the weekend? Um. I suppose, uh, yeah, I suppose France impressed me given the pressure that they they were under, you know, opening their own tournament at home. Um, uh, you know, the show that they put on before and and then during the game, I thought it was a cracker. Um, Apart from the anthems, the well, butchering yeah, everyone's of given the out, anthems. Everyone's given out about the anthems. Now, in fairness, <laughs> South Africa, um, Scotland, I think it worked well for those two anthems, okay, but the yeah. rest. No, just, oh. yeah, they don't oh. kind of... They're not summing no, up any kind no, of it just energy. It really no, yeah. it's awful. Um, but yeah, I think uh, France were were really good to deal with the pressure that that they have. They were good, but not something that I would fear fear going forward at all. I like your confidence, Peter. Yeah. Um, look, I think Ireland had a job to do, and they did it very, very well. Um, I think you've got to take your hat off to them. I know Romania, not the best opposition, no. um, but. South Africa showed glimpses, England slipping under the radar. But again, like Johnny said, there's nothing there at the moment. Yes, granted, it's very early stages and everyone is going to improve. Um, Would you be worried about Australia in any way? No. Eddie Jones, he knows what no, to do no, at I wouldn't, I w- No, I wouldn't really. I wouldn't. I think they're just, I think if it came to knockout stages with Australia, they don't have that belief and confidence behind them in the last 18 months. I think you know they can he can try and instill a little bit of false confidence in them what in whatever way he normally does but when it comes down to those crunch games you rely on your previous experiences and what you've been through and they just haven't won enough for me to have that built up inside them any other talking points from the weekend anything else stand out what about the traffic light system from the spring box? Uh, yeah, uh, d- look. It's Johnny's, Johnny's been in that at Nace for yeah. the, last, <laughs> the last few years. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah no, I, I don't really see that much of an issue with it. You know, there's obviously a bit more to it and we know, both know Felix very well. But like, people are mic'd up anyway and you see guys there's a, a, a picture was it one of the French guys going on before he went on and he had an earpiece in he was obviously coach he was obviously you know talking to um, you know his coach so I think messages are getting on the pitch yeah. anyway if it's an easier one to have a yellow or a red or a blue taking cone taking the spotlight off Libok a small bit isn't it yeah, <laughs> yeah. the pressure I, off his yeah, yeah I do um Oh, I I don't think I think goal kicking is going to be a big thing. You know, speaking about Libak, I think that could mm-hmm. be um, the undoing of them. Um, just the consistency across that probably that 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 could be something that that might undo them as they go forward. But traffic light system <laughs> yeah, it is no, what it is. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's um, look with 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 time of the essence they're just look and I know you always kind of look in these kind of key stages probably more so the last few minutes of a game okay what are we going to do you're looking at maybe bonus points or points difference then it kind of comes down to it okay guys up in the box might know okay you need to kind of kick to the post or yeah. we need another try depending on how the rest of the group is going then it might be a good opportunity to do it but just being know. a bit inventive yeah. Yeah. yeah well we'll leave it there my thanks to Johnny and to Peter that's it the Rugby World Cup is up and running and we'll do it all again on House of Rugby with thanks to Heineken next weekend until then Slonga Fold 
Sports Joe presents House of Rugby. Together with Heineken. Get the facts, be drink aware, visit drinkaware.ie.